welcome to another episode from the Ed to Ed. Um, revisiting my 1920s era Brandis Brandy's uh, headphones here, headset. And a, f a number of episodes ago I had uh, featured making reproduction ear cap covers, uh, 3D printing them, being that mine originally were broken and so forth. And the story I probably mentioned back then is I got these as a kid and played with them back then and they did seem to work back then. And I thought I'd revisit how well they work. I, I'd gotten some questions in you know, comments uh, about you know how well these things work and I haven't actually um, you know obviously run them since I was a kid so I thought I'd give it a give them a go. And um, measuring the, uh, the the resistance of the coils uh, they turn out to be, you know, the the 2,000 ohms is expected. It's a uh, thousand ohms per uh, per side here. The the cable itself does have a a little bit of a break in the wire, and I had to kind of keep twisting this wire until I got it the circuit to to make. So I'll have to look into that sometime. Researching these guys, it does look like they are polarized, and uh, there is kind of a leader string here as it were on this side of the cord it was originally red the dye is kind of faded away and it now looks mostly white but when you go to hook up your uh, headsets if you happen to have a pair of these or something like these uh, um, iron disc steel disc driven solenoid uh, solenoid um, um, coil driven uh, headsets you'll want to uh, make certain that you you kind of look at the polarity and probably just drive them on a um, single-ended amplifier or obviously for a crystal radio these would be just perfect um, and make certain that the uh, the side with the uh, stripe on it, it uh, red stripe especially if you're lucky to have red is uh, positive and then of course the non marked side is negative so I thought I'd uh, do some experiments here with a signal generator and then maybe uh, an mp3 player or something like that and see if I can scientifically uh, measure these guys' performance and um, maybe compare them to, say, uh, you know, modern, modest grade headsets as far as how they behave voltage uh, loading wise, current loading output, and so forth, uh, acoustical quality, and so forth. And, um, you know, play around with these guys, learn a little bit about them, and uh, ultimately have them uh, ready to do some further uh, homebrew uh, radio projects and uh, antique radio restoration. I have a, um, a, a 1921-1922 Westinghouse radiola, areola, um, you know, a re receiver that I'd like to have these um, work with because they're just perfectly period. And several other uh, mid early mid twenties radios I'd, I'd like to bring out and, and work on eventually. Most of all, I'd also like to just uh, homebrew some of my own stuff just for my own learning purposes. And obviously, one of the most logical things to do is a um, uh, a crystal radio set. So set this guy up, play around with it, and see what I come up with. Okay, so I've kind of set up my uh, oscilloscope, and I've been kind of playing around with what would be um, kind of compromised values because what I want to do is I want to compare these uh, old Maxwell headsets which you know aren't, certainly aren't the top of the line but they're you know comparatively modern uh, I'm going to look them up they're HP uh, 550's and then of course my 1920's headsets and at the moment I just want to look at the electrical load characteristics of these guys and so what I've done is I've kind of tried to figure out what the um, Average signal would work for um, both headsets and kind of be uh, manageable. So I've got uh, over here a little old um, cell phone is acting as a little MP3 player, and I have it kind of rigged up with some uh, wires, uh, alligator clips, to uh, just take the output of the uh, what the headset is being fed signal-wise and pipe it into the, the oscilloscope at, at a position that seems to kind of work compromise for both uh, as far as voltages, divisions, and so forth. 
and at a volume that I find reasonably comfortable for both. I, would, I think the end result volume is a little lower for the 1920s headset and a little bit higher for the, uh, the uh, modern headsets, but more or less the same. But what's interesting is how drastically different the, uh, the loading of the circuit is. So what I have is um, some uh, music from um, YouTube's um, creator's um, library, so it's open open source as it were, or, or royalty free, it's uh, called Skyscraper MP3 if you're interested in it. And when I, now I have the uh, voltage uh, division set to uh, 20 millivolts and it, you know, um, I think a reasonable compromise on time and I don't have the trigger on. And the big thing is to look at the uh, RMS voltages uh, mostly and then I have the uh, these lines set to kind of what seemed to be an average-ish highest peak between the two to give it as kind of a kind of a scale of what it is. But the big thing is the, the voltage loading on this guy and just how low it is. So I'll play this music. Right now this is um, the, the audio you're hearing is just the um, the uh, skyscraper music straight off of my um, laptop for this video recording. You're not hearing it directly from the headsets. Uh, I'll get back to um, trying to use a microphone and, and trying to assess the audio quality from the headsets later. This is mostly just kind of a, a signal uh, strength uh, voltage in versus signal out I'm kind of trying to analyze here without really you know, being a, an audiophile, not really knowing I'm doing this you know, kind of a comparison between the two. So I'll, I'll give you this um, run for a little while here, and then I'll put on the um, 1920s headset here. So big thing here is uh, RMS voltage. You know, it's, I, I, guess, I guess what I'm basically saying is I'm really quite surprised how um, little signal is actually put out by like a, a little MP3 player. Uh, uh, cell phone um, head jack voltage. It looks like um, if you drive it really hard, it might come out to like one and a half volts or something like that. And right now, I have the the volume set about three quarters of that, roughly. And of course, uh, that that voltage when I was looking at that was without any uh, uh, headset uh, hooked up. It, was, it seemed to be the highest voltage I could get. And when I was earlier experimenting with uh, driving my uh, 20s headset, I was using the uh, signal generator, probably way over driving it, because that guy can go pound uh, voltages uh, down to as little as, uh, you know, maybe a quarter of a volt, and all the way up to like 27 volts is what I've measured, so it, it can way overdrive these headsets, it looks like. And so, anyhow, let's go ahead and um, put on the 1920s headsets and, and give that a comparison. So I'll undo these guys. Carefully hook up my um, headset. Now the one thing you'll really notice, it's really quite uh, telling, is how much AC noise will uh, be fed into this headset because it's such um, high impedance it's basically just not um, loading the circuit at all. And so this is AC noise that seems to be coming in from my oscilloscope and being really magnified somehow by the uh, the um, coils, I guess, in the, the headset. I'm not sure exactly what's going on there. That's just AC noise that the, the player isn't even playing yet. So now I'll play the player. And now you can see that the circuit is loaded hardly at all and, and I'll have to now change the, the scale down to um, a, a lower value which really is the compromise between the two. I wish it was something maybe kind of in between here uh, that would work for uh, you know, volume comfort level actually listening to it versus what I can uh, read on the display but you can see that the, uh, the loading of the circuit is very very, very light. It, I'm amazed how little power is required to drive these uh, headphones. 
And right now, I'd say the headphones, if I was wearing them, uh, just based on my kind of setting this up ahead of time, would be maybe slightly lower volume than the modern headsets, but not by much. Audio quality, it's not as good as obviously the modern, but considering they're 100 years old, really early technology, how you go about it, I'm really very impressed by these guys. And obviously their original um, design needs of the day was a device that would generate a usable audio sound using uh, very, very little power because the earliest um, radio receivers and, and so forth had generated very little in the way of an output signal. Um, being it was just like a crystal radio or a very early vacuum tube and you just had nothing to work with and then uh, you know coming up with the audio amplifiers was quite a struggle at the time um, and of course trying to come up with an audio amplifier you could actually drive it from a loudspeaker that was quite a challenge in itself so it, these little headsets were really quite an impressive achievement in their day considering all they basically are is a, a coil of super fine wire and um, going across an air gap that's pulling on um, a little very thin piece of steel sheet metal and then there's a, a permanent magnet that's kind of helping to kind of um, I'm not exactly certain what you'd call it kind of biasing the, the field strength so that you're either building or, 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 or uh, reducing the field strength mostly from the permanent magnets and not from the uh, coil itself the coil is uh, it appears to be contributing very little uh, power to it. So anyhow, I think that probably gives you an idea of the audio signal strength and loading of the uh, headset. Now, let's see if I can set up a microphone and hope to um, show you uh, maybe some audio quality. And this will be a little more iffy as to whether or not it'll be a, a, a you know a, a, you know practical, real usable demonstration. But it's worth a try. So what I have here is a really crude test arrangement. I know it's not going to be very authoritatively scientific, but I have this really good quality, comparatively speaking, microphone. I, I, I looked around and I have a bunch of microphones and they're all very poor quality. This is the best one I have and I've experimented with it for some of my YouTube videos. It's a little preamped um, lapel style microphone. And I'm hoping to do is put the microphone into the, the basically the, the hole where the, of the earpiece here and I want to try and um, just have it touch that surface and then I'll, I'll probably cap it with this chunk of foam here. The problem is this, the idea of trying to get it as repeatable as possible and then ultimately what I'd like to do is uh, uh, go and, uh, and al analyze the, uh, the strength between the headsets. I'm trying to make it as, as repeatable as possible and I know it's nowhere near you know, passing, passing scientific mustard, but that's about the best I can hope for on that. Anyhow, here's this setup as scientific as I can. This is what I'll call the right-hand side of the headset. Ultimately, I want to compare the left versus right. The right-hand side has a bunch of extra uh, tape residue on it and so forth, so I think I can kind of distinguish who's who here. So I'll play this guy. And it's still at the, the same uh, volume that the um, previous oscilloscope uh, testing was at, so that should be a pretty fair comparison.
Okay, so now that we've kind of listened into this side, let's uh, give this guy the left side a try for all it's worth here and um, see what we can see when the difference is. I'm pretty sure this side is, uh, isn't uh, as strong and I'll have to figure out what I can do to tweak it, tweak this uh, particular um, fellow up a bit. Initially I was thinking that uh, what I can call the right hand side has the extra tape. I thought it was weaker but it had uh, some iron filings in there and I took those iron filings out and the, the strength of the magnet was quite a bit stronger and I did find that the audio seems like to me is stronger than this side. So it could be that the magnets on this side are weaker. Maybe there's some iron filings I didn't see on that side I could clean up. There might be some differences in the diaphragms. Maybe I'll try those and, and various other things. But give this same thing a try again where I'll uh, play this um, signal and uh, try it again here. Now as a, a comparison, what I need to do is figure out a way of getting the uh, quote modern headsets, rather middling grade I'll, I'll admit, uh, but it's a little more of a reasonably fair comparison if I was to use really high end headsets that really wouldn't prove anything, would it? Because this is you know a very old uh, headset and obviously it just wouldn't be a fair comparison. So the nice thing about this uh, old um, pair of uh, headsets uh, is that they have a monorail uh, switch on them so uh, I can set it to monorail and I don't really care too much about it uh, the balance of the speakers they do seem to be very balanced so from that standpoint it's really not an issue so the biggest problem here is coming up with any sort of a comparable uh, sound coupling uh, that isn't uh, kind of unfair as far as uh, signal um, measurements go so I'm going to try more or less the same coupling um, arrangement with hopefully not too much sound coming from the other headset as I can't really um, can't really isolate these headsets as well as it could the uh, the, the old um, the old headsets where they can uh, kind of fold out so I'm going to try and see what I can do about making certain this other headset this new pair and, and just basically get one headset not that I have any concern about the uh, headsets have any sort of balance issue which I okay so I have uh, I have the, the modern headsets kind of set up in a way that hopefully this extra headset won't contribute to the signed site that I'm trying to measure uh, not as easy they don't fold open basically like the uh, the old 1920s headset so it's harder to isolate the sound and I only care about one side uh, in this case obviously I really don't care that if both sides are have the same volume they, they seem to whereas the my old uh, 20s headset, I, I believe one side's quite a bit weaker than the other, so I will play the music again and get a, hopefully a somewhat comparable uh, recording.
so here's the output files for the recording of the 1920s headset right hand side, 1920s headset left hand side, the modern headset comparison, and then the raw file from um, YouTube's creator space uh, called Skyscraper. So as you can kind of see, uh, the, the strength it looks like is quite a bit less for the uh, 20s headset and of course you can see the the modern headset actually it has um, what appears to be quite a bit lower signal response, but you got to take into account this is just simply the digital file, so I'm not really sure that digital file itself really means anything until you actually play it through a transdu transducer and then of course the uh, microphone uh, recording system uh, you know, when it meets the real world as it were. So the kind of the area of interest is kind of through here, there's a, a quite a dynamic piece of the music right there. So I'll play this through here to kind of give you a um, kind of reminder what it's like through here first. Just kind of note the uh, peak signal there. Of course, like I say, this is the raw file. So now let's look at the um, the Maxwell headset uh, right around this area. note that signal peak and we'll look at the right hand side of this the, of the 1920s headset Okay, I guess note the peak there, and then last but not least, uh, once we figure out why it's kind of playing along the weak side, the left hand side. Okay, so, you know, kind of those peaks. I guess what I find interesting is when I was playing these, uh, the, the 20s headset and the Maxwell headset, they sounded really not too far apart from each other volume-wise. And uh, yet, according to this recording there, you, they would appear at least for perception quite a bit different. And I wonder somehow if maybe the, the nature of the uh, ear cups on those headsets, they, you know, they, I, I often wondered why they persisted on using these really uncomfortable uh, ear cups on all these different model headsets. You, all these m different companies of the time for many, many years, I, I think these, this style headset was 
you know, used clear into the 30s and 40s. And you wonder why they went with such what appeared to be uncomfortable earpiece, uh, earpieces compared to, say, the modern headsets where it's all padded and so forth. And I wonder if it isn't acoustically more efficient what they've done. And just the way it cups to my ears or, uh, you know, somebody's ears, you wind up with better sound transmission because, at least from my perception, we're wearing these headsets, they didn't sound a whole lot quieter than these headsets. Especially, once again, given the, uh, the loading of the circuit. So it's something else that would be kind of interesting to explore. I guess the next thing is to look at the full spectrum of very low frequencies to very high frequencies and see if I can get a better idea where the, uh, the sound works well and falls off on these headsets. But you can kind of see in this dynamic area anyways where they, uh, even, even the quote modern headset tends to have kind of a loss. I'll play that again just as kind of a reminder. The area is kind of right from here. So what I've done now is I've taken and recorded sweeps through the signal generator onto my PC and then kind of cut it out a little bits of chunks where I had to change ranges and so forth. It's a little choppy and it's not perfect. And then at the very top of the uh, range at the times uh, 1000 here, it's very questionable whether or not the sound card is actually uh, recording anything very well. So take it with a grain of salt towards the end there. Biggest thing is, uh, this part is going to be rather unpleasant audio, uh, uh, audio wise. So, assuming that you're even uh, still with me on this uh, YouTube video, uh, if you don't want to listen to some unpleasant sound, this is probably the time to tune out because this is where uh, I'm going to try and actually get the sound out of this guy that it's actually able to um, hear. And try and analyze each side of the headset and then ultimately compare it with the, the modern headset. And as you can kind of see the, uh, the, the, the overall, how the signal is basically presented and analyzed its predominance and, and lack thereof. Uh, I think the simplest thing is if you're really interested in, in going into the detail and you really understand this stuff would be to pause this video and, and have a look at what they all mean. I, I myself am kind of vague idea what this is all meaning to me. Basically, uh, as you kind of expect, you know, it's a steel plate on these 1920s headset and so the higher frequency stuff is going to be gone maybe some other ranges and then you'll have odd artifacts where this uh, steel plate because there's no dampening involved will resonate in a strange way and so you'll have little artifacts that show up that wasn't in the original music and of course if you look at the the, the raw mp3 file that's uh, you know no transducer you know, strangeness going on and absorbed anything. It's just the raw file without any 
any you know theoretical loss uh, being concerned of and then uh, even the um, modern headsets have a you know noticeable amount of loss and they're low end headsets headsets that's obviously why they're low end I'm sure that if I was to have gotten some really expensive headsets the the results would be so much better than this but it gives you an idea of the limitations of the twenties headsets and how you know they're obviously good for voice communication you're not really too worried about the fidelity of it all and for really early recordings you know back in the day when these headsets were used and people might have been transmitting music via you know gramophone records or maybe live performances with really early equipment the losses for these headsets probably didn't matter a whole lot because the whole signal itself getting to the listener up to that point was already uh, you know pretty challenged uh, but you know considering how low uh, a load these headsets present to a really early circuitry that they're able to produce what they're able to produce I think is pretty cool so after a bunch of analysis I think what I'm going to do now is uh, call it a, a video here it's getting a bit long and I'll probably pick up with another video here uh, I got some ideas as to maybe what I can do on um, figuring out why the strength of the one side is a little bit less than the other and you know one thought is of course to just simply swap these uh, diaphragms by the way there's, uh, they measure at about seven thousandths uh, thick steel um, looking at on the inside of this guy I don't see any uh, iron filings that I had removed from this side and so uh, one thought to do is I have some uh, this really nifty plastic that has kind of some um, ferrous material in it as you can see magnetic fields with uh, um, and see if that might help some I also have a compass here to uh, determine uh, field uh, directions maybe I might be able to determine strength and I might experiment with um, things like maybe um, trying to bump up the field strength of these guys and uh, maybe adding a little permanent magnets or something like that so hopefully you enjoyed this video and uh, look forward to having you come back and look at uh, part two of this video on these Brandis 1920s headsets and thanks for watching and sorry for the earworm <laughs>